open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We are continuing our study through the book of Genesis, and hopefully we'll actually finish this, this chapter this evening. As you guys are turning there, I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and mercy towards us. Your mercy endures forever, Lord. We thank you for extending your mercy upon our lives through the work of your son, Jesus. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And Father, as we dig into your word, may you continue to show us your goodness and mercy. Father, I pray right now you would have a full meal for your children, that you would feed your sheep this, this evening, the good manna from heaven. Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And may your son be on display. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Genesis chapter 1. We are going verse by verse, line upon line, through the book of Genesis, as we typically do. That is our teaching style, line upon line, precept upon precept. Now, as we go through the book of Genesis, we're making sure we understand that this is the most important book in the Bible. It may not be my favorite book. It may not be the one you like the most, but it is the most important book in the Bible because it lays the foundations of our faith. It is the bedrock on which everything else is built. It is not mythology. It is theology. It is history. It is how the Lord how the Lord created the world, and everything that we know about our faith starts in Genesis. So it lays the foundation of our faith, and when you understand Genesis, it brings illumination to the whole narrative of Scripture. If you've ever struggled to understand what certain Scripture passages or books of the Bible are all about, typically that lack of understanding comes from a shaky foundation of having not studied the book of Genesis or even the book of Exodus yourself. This lays the foundation and it will bring clarity. It kind of straightens everything out. It is our plumb bob for the rest of scripture. And as we go through the book of Genesis, we are looking for Jesus in Genesis and we will see him on every single page. Now, last time we were in the book, we took a bit of a sabbatical from it last week. Uh, the Lord put a burden upon my heart. If you guys missed that sermon, um, it's called Crossing the Rubicon. It is on our YouTube page and it will be uploaded tomorrow to our SoundCloud page. I urge you guys, it really has to do with some of the events that happened over the past two weeks. But when we were in Book of Genesis the week before, we covered days two through five. We looked at what the Lord created and what he spoke into existence upon this earth in those days. We saw our God as a God of order and of purpose. And we saw him as the God who provides before the need arises. He is the God who literally goes before us. And before he just places man into the vacuum of space, he creates a, a universe that is perfectly balanced for life to exist. He creates an atmosphere around the earth that we can breathe. He creates the oceans. He creates life in the oceans and in the air. He creates everything we would need to eat out of the ground and in all of the plants. He creates everything for the pinnacle of why he's creating, which is man. The reason why he's creating all of this in this order and laying down provision ahead of time is because he has a predestined outcome, which is to create man, someone he would have intimate communion with. And we looked at some lessons from corn, from the owl, from whales, and from the giraffe. You guys could go back to that week. It was a pretty fun one. Now, tonight, we're going to finish up day six. Day six. And we're going to look at the concept, briefly, of irreducible complexity. Irreducible complexity. We're going to look at a beetle bomb and the problem of the platypus. That should give us some insight into irreducible complexity. Then we're going to talk about what it means to be made in the image of God. There's a lot being said about, oh, we are God's image bearers, so we can X, Y, Z. However, I believe scripture really simplifies what that means when you take it in context with the whole chapter. Then the question we will end on is, do you see what God sees? Do you see what God sees? So we're going to start in verse 24. We left off verse 23, so we're going to read verse 24 through the end of the chapter. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, 
and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, every tree whose fruit yields seeds. To to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the air, to every bird of the air, sorry, every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, And to everything which creeps on the earth, in which there is a life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and then the morning were the sixth day. As we are coming to the close of this narrative, this overview of creation, of the seven days of creation, or six days and one rest day. We will get to the rest day in the beginning of chapter 2. Technically speaking, those first couple verses of chapter 2 should be marked as the the end verses of chapter 1, but you know they added the, the numbers and the chapter markings later on. But we have to keep in mind that when we read in chapter 2 the creation of man, that is a more intensive, detailed account of the creation of man, whereas the first Uh, chapter is the creation overall, the creation of the universe. And that's just the Hebrew style of writing. They give you a synopsis up front and then details to follow. That's why you will see in the rest of the book of Genesis, we'll see a whole uh, genealogy of all these people with little bits and details about them. But then we have the specifics of the life of Abraham or the specifics of the life of Jacob. And it's all of these broad scoping genealogical chapters, then it goes to the individual. And that's just the Hebrew style of writing. We see a lot of that in actually the book of Revelation as well, but we talked about that during our study. So thus far, God has been building with one goal in mind, layers of provision, ultimately for his narrative and plan for mankind. That is what the Lord is building towards. Now that goes against the ideology of evolution, because evolution says there is no plan. It is all randomness. It is all chance. It is all happenstance. And those who say that God would build with those means do not know the God of order of the Bible. He is specific and intentional with every detail he lays his hands upon. And we've seen that from the idea that in the vegetables would be the necessary nutrients to sustain life, and then within the life would be the necessary mechanisms by which to digest the food to get the nutrients. How can that happen accidentally? How can the fruit evolve separate from the individual, and yet the mechanism and the sustenance both evolve to match? That alone is a statistical impossibility let alone for it to happen with thousands of types of animals and thousands of types of fruits. Our God is a God of great order, and he's building unto a purpose. He has an intention. It is not random chance. And and really what this boils down to, as we're seeing the Lord create with such precision, it really comes down to the, the idea that what you believe about origins, about where man came from, where the universe came from, really reflects upon what you believe about the character of God. I mean, if you believe our God is a God who's not in control, he's not at the steering wheel, he's not sovereign, then yeah, you know, random chance might fit into his plan because he's barely got a plan anyway. He's flying by the seat of his pants. I wouldn't want to serve that God, honestly. A guy who turns around while he's supposed to be driving the car and say, hey, what do you want to do next? While there's explosions happening in front of him. That's not the type of God we see in the universe. Now, again, we look at our world and our universe through the lens of the fall where things like entropy have happened and things are now going towards disorder. And so people will look at the earth today and say, why would God create it this way? He didn't create it this way. He created it this way. We jacked it up. (laughs) 
And it's been getting more and more jacked up the more time has gone by. So that is a great way of, of really bring, bridging the gap for people when they say, hey, why would God create evil in the world? It's like he didn't initially. Evil is something we brought into the world by our rebellion. And then you can present the bad news, which will then be a platform for the good news. God created with perfection. Everything was very good. And we're going to look at that. Now let's look at verse 24 and 25 where we started off. It says, then God said, this is beginning of the sixth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, creeping, uh, sorry, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, the cattle according to its kind, everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that was, it was good. You guys notice a repetitive pattern in that? What word is repeated? Kind, 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 kind. Now, uh, you know, modern scientists will use the words like, you know, the, the idea of, of the, the species or the subspecies or the, or the family, or all, and they, they break down these animals into very specific subsets, but the Lord doesn't speak in those terms. And, you know, man will be like, well, you know, how many millions of species did God create? Well, first of all, you created the word species. God just created them according to their kind. That's the subset that he uses. That's the division that he uses according to his kind. It's kind of like if you, as an adult, were to build a bookshelf for your child and you put it in their room and you built this bookshelf and you put it there and they're like, Daddy, that's a flip. You're like, no, it's a bookshelf. No, it's a flip. <laughs> I built it. I know what it is. I know what the intentions are. Mm-mm. You can't just make up the word and then accuse God of not knowing what it is. And that's what you see the scientists do all the time. Well, does God know about this animalia and this genus? And it's like, dude, come on. God knows what he created. He was there. Evolutionists weren't. (laughs) They weren't there. (laughs) Side note. But according to its kind, that is how God creates. He creates in classifications of animals. And everything procreates according to its kind. Now, within each kind of animal, I believe God put in variabilities, variations, and adaptability. He had to make some sort of adaptability. Now, again, now those adaptations, not evolution, but those adaptations that a, 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 a sp- specific kind of animal can grow into will vary based on its circumstance, will vary based on its surroundings as well. But that does not make them a different species of animal. These are categories that can reproduce. That's what it means when he says kind. They bear fruit according to its kind. He said the same thing about the vegetation. So how many kinds, if you were to use God's metric of what an animal is, what a kind of animal is, how many kinds of animals are there? Well, in the broadest generalization, there's some scientific debate, but the broadest generalization of animals, excluding fish and bugs, and that'll be important when we get to the flood, but excluding fish and bugs, there's about 1,500 different kinds of animals. Now, the modern scientists will be like, there, there's way more species. No, 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 like kind. Because you can say species of cat, right? There's, there's a feline, there's a, there's a house cat, there's tiger, there's lion, there's mountain lion, there's, and you're, you're divvying it up. But all of them reproduce the same. All of them look the same. They have the same makeup, the same genetic coding, and some variability within them. They are the same kind of animal. So in the broadest generalization of cat, bear, dog, stuff like that, about 1,500 kinds of animals at most, which by the way, now if you take God's order of things regarding kinds of animals, and Noah had to put two of every kind of animal and seven of some, that means that Noah was only carrying about 7,000 animals on the ark, including dinosaurs. Not the big ones, small dinosaurs. You get them when they're small. Right? Same with elephants, right? Why would Noah bring a full-size elephant on the ark? <laughs> think, think about that in many ways. A grown old elephant. Why not bring a soft, squishy, durable baby elephant? The older and bigger you are, you're moving more mass, you fall down, you hurt yourself, all of a sudden you're done, right? Especially you hit 35, you fall down, you lay there for a little bit. <laughs> Kids bounce. I, some of the kids who run around here after service, they're like, 
boom! And then I, and they're like, you're expecting a cry, but then you just see them running off into the distance. Whereas if you're an adult and you fall like that, ambulance is coming. They're more durable. Babies are more durable. But again, we'll get more into that during the flood. But we see that as far as God's classification, about 1,500 kinds of animals. And the, the obvious, you know, um, retort from the evolutionist is, well, you think that all the varieties of dogs that we have today came from just two dogs on Noah's Ark or at the initial creation? You think that over 6,000 years ago that we get the huge varieties of dogs? No, I don't just think that. Scientists know that. In fact, if you bring up slide number one, it'll show you the graph that all dog breeds come from one dog. This is scientifically provable. We, we know that all of the canine species came from two original dogs, and we can trace it back, a lot of which we can do because when you get a purebred, you have the lineage to know that dog is purebred, which is crazy to me that a pug comes from like a bulldog as well. That's insane that they're of the same family. I get the ugly smudge face, but one can eat the other one. That's the difference. But it shows you the broad variability within dogs. Within the original dog DNA, this is what this chart means. Within the original dog DNA, God pre-coded expansive variability for adaptability to any future situation or circumstance. And it was a broad gene pool. That's something we call the gene pool, where you have so much of the genetic code, not that has been pieced off through selective breeding, that you have expansive variability within your genetic code. So the original dog had to have all of the original information to make all of the varieties of dogs. Then you get down to the shallow end of the gene pool. That's what happens when you selectively breed animals. You had original dog probably looked like wolf, wolf 1.0, right? Just this big beastly dog and it, it, it could hunt, it had a great sense of smell, great sense of hearing. It was strong, and it was like chief of dogs. But through selective breeding and through mutations and through the thinning of the gene pool, you get something like my dog, which is in slide number two. My dog, James Baxter, Darcy Rochester, Eustace Padilla. Now, when we look at his attributes, strength 400, negative 400, sorry, Loudness plus 500, cuteness over 9,000. Special attacks include shriek, standing push, mini chop, and flying headbutt. Weakness, pretty much everything. Those of you who have meet, met Baxter, you know this to be true. If he were a Pokemon, this is exactly his stats to come out. All right? Now, his gene pool has been very limited. He's about 20 pounds, and if he were to have to survive in the wild, Two of his attributes would cancel each other out. One, he's small. Two, he doesn't think he's small. <laughs> and since he's been bred in his, in his subset of the species of dog, since he's been bred down to the shallow end of the gene pool, the cute end of the gene pool, yes, but the shallow end of the gene pool, if he were to live during the days after the flood and tried to survive, we would have no more dogs. <laughs> that would be it. You know, he'd come up to the first dinosaur, be like, rah, 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 and then he'd get monched, and dog is just ended with him. So unfortunately, if you breed a Baxter with another animal that looks like Baxter, it's not going to produce a gray wolf. Well, why? Because that information has been lost through selective breeding. Now, when you understand that fact, that the broad set of kind of animal, when God created the original kind, they had to have had all of the genetic coding and, and potential variabilities in order to make all of these diverse, beautiful subsets of the same kind of animal. That means it had to have been created complete up front. Why does that mean that? Because when you are breeding, you never get any new information. You select information and break off other portions of information. You never get new information. Mutations never add information. You always have a corrupting or a loss of the genetic cone. So variability and adaptability never adds any information. That gives us two ideas 
and two principles that we have to operate by. The genetic code, first and foremost, the first principle is that the genetic code that was created in these original animals is the fingerprint of the creator because it had vast adaptability. It had provision for any circumstance that kind of animal would eventually find itself in. If it was gonna be in cold weather, those through, through selective breeding or through those who would not leave that area due to you know, cold weather, the ones who had thicker coats or double undercoats or had a fat layer under them, they would be the ones to be able to survive and they would have to breed with other ones who can survive in that cold in order to make a husky, in order to make you know, a, a Malamute. And you would get those Alaskan dogs, you know what I mean, who could survive super cold temperatures. But the information was already there. The potential for a double coat for a fat layer was already there. It was just selectively breeded by the circumstance or even by individuals who needed a good sled dog in order to get something that would be able to survive those circumstances. This, again, affirms our point that we made the last time we were in Genesis. God's provision is there before the need arises. So the first note we get about this idea of the gene pool and adaptability ver, uh, in, within the kinds of animal is that the genetic code is the fingerprint of the creator and his provision for adaptability and variety are there. Secondarily, we have to come to the conclusion that the initial design and information had to be present at the beginning because you do not add information through mutation. That is an impossibility. It goes against every law of physics there is. You cannot add information through mutation. So big dog, what kind of dog was roaming the earth? Obviously not a James Baxter, Darcy Rochester, Eustace Padilla. Wolf, big, animal, and we can trace that back. This brings us to the idea of something called irreducible complexity. It's kind of a subset of this idea that everything was specifically designed for a purpose. Irreducible complexity in layman's terms is a complex system in which all the components are necessary to function. And the removal of any one of those components will equal a loss of functionality of the whole system. Basically, it means that there are things within God's creation, almost everything within God's creation has a, a structure, a function, a purpose. It's almost like cogs in a clock or like, a, like an engine. And you can't just reach your hand into a modern day engine and start ripping wires and think it's still gonna work. Now, think about what evolution teaches. It teaches that the car, so to speak, the engine, the mechanism, the wheels within this watch were added piece by piece over time. Well, how within the lifetime of whatever animal it's building, how would that be beneficial just to have a cog, just to have a wheel, just to have a horn, just to have an air conditioner without having an engine, without having gasoline, without having tires? It would still be just as useless as the adaptation prior to it until it reaches its full system with all of its components. Evolution says through random chance, structure was built. That's not what God says. God completed the structure and it's been deteriorating ever since. That's the idea of irreducible complexity. Now, where do we see this? Well, we see this in all creation. By the way, there are those who say, well, life started with a single cell, a simple single cell organism. There is no such thing. The smallest amoeba, the smallest single cell organism, now that we have the ability to look under electron microscopes and see the structure of the thing, is more complex than a rocket ship. It has more functionality. It has more movability. It has a waste management system. It operates like a small city. It has defenses. It has coding within it, like a municipal building that tells what the cell to do. It reproduces when it is damaged. You, we can't build a rocket ship that reproduces when it's damaged. When it's damaged, Houston, we have a problem. But a single cell organism has all those mechanisms? 
So first and foremost, the lie about simple organisms, no such thing. We now know that. We're now catching up to Genesis, by the way, with our modern science. We're now validating scripture because we can see beyond just what the human eyes can see. Speaking of which, the human eye. The human eye. Now, your eyes are amazing. Not all of ours, because a lot of us have these things. And again, the fall, right? This is representation of the fall. I don't think the Lord created us to wear spectacles, right? To be a spectacle, yes, but not to wear spectacles. That is not why the Lord created us. When he created the human eye, though, when you look at the general function of the human eye, it is an amazing mechanism. Let me read this from you. This is from back in April 1994. The human brain consists of approximately 12 billion cells, forming 120 trillion interconnections. The light-sensitive retina of the eye, which is really a part of the brain, contains over 10 million photoreceptor cells. These cells capture light patterns formed by the lens and then convert it in, into complex electrical signal, signals which are then sent to a special area of the brain, which are then transformed into a sensation we call vision. In an article by Byte Magazine from April 1985, John Stevens compares the signal processing abilities of the cells in the retina to that of the most sophisticated computer designed by man at the time, the Cray supercomputer. His, in that article, he said, while today's digital hardware is extremely impressive, it is clear that the human retina real-time performance goes on challenges. Actually, to simulate 10 milliseconds, one one hundredth of a second, of complete processing of even one single nerve cell from the retina, it would require the solution of about 500 simultaneously nonlinear differential equations a hundred times and take at least several minutes of processing time on the Cray supercomputer. Keep in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting in other complex ways. It would take at least a minimum of 100 years of Cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye every second. A hundred years of computer processing time and your brain does it through your retina, through the light, coming through your eyes, hitting the rods and cones and going into your optic nerve like that. If the supercomputer is obviously the product of intelligent design, how much more obvious is the eye a product of intelligent design? And yet, Evolutionists are dead certain that the human eye and everything else in nature came into being by pure trance, chance and intrinsic properties of nature. Evolutionists occasionally admit that it is difficult even for them to believe such a thing. Ernst Meyer, uh, for example, has conceded and say, and quote, it is considerable strain on one's credulity to assume that the finely balanced system, such a certain sense organ like eyes, vertebrae, and bird's feathers, could be improved by random mutations. The evolutionists look at the eye. Even Charles Darwin, in his own writings, said that thinking the eye came about by a chance or randomness is pure foolishness. And yet he chose to believe that. Willingly ignorant, as the Bible puts it. I know this is ignorant, but I choose to believe it. Why? Because to believe the latter, that God created me, means I'm accountable to him. Believing in evolution is not a matter of science. It is a religion. It is a matter of choice. And if you take that eye that does those calculations so quickly, and you guys know this if you've ever gotten a speck of dust in your eye or an eye injury. All of a sudden, the whole thing doesn't want to work. It's hard enough when a bunch of pollen gets in there and your eyes start getting red because of allergies. But if just one of those mechanisms were to fail or were not to be present, the whole eye would not work. The whole eye would not work. And there's example after example within human physiology where if you remove a bit the whole system doesn't function. Whereby making that little incremental evolutionary step or mutation uh, of no purpose, of no function. It wouldn't even be something you would 
willingly know or pass on to your progeny. So to think that this happened, the I happened over millions of years, it is utter foolishness, let alone the rest of things in creation. What about the termite? You guys ever had termites? Termites in your walls? There's one thing everyone knows about termites. Termites eat wood, right? We know that about termites. Termites, they chomp on cedar. They munch on wood. That's what they do. That's how they eat. But do you know <laughs> that the termite cannot process cellulose? What does that mean? The termite eats wood, but it cannot digest wood. What? Well, why would God create such a foolish creature? Do you know that there is a bacteria that lives within the termite that processes cellulose and the byproduct is provided nutri nutrients for the termite that the bacteria lives in? That's the only reason why termites can eat wood. So a quick question for you. Which evolved first, the termite or the bacteria? One can't exist without the other. The bacteria has to exist, that specific bacteria has to exist within the body, within the digestive system of the termite. And the termite needs the bacteria in, only to, in order to digest the cellulose in the wood and turn it into food. Which one came first? The wood? <laughs> the wood came first. It did, according to the days, right? Creeping thieves are day six. That's a smart aleck answer, Kenny. <laughs> uh, old youth group kids getting the best of me all the time. So irreducible complexity. Which one of all first, the termite or the bacteria? The bacteria is what is needed. But you have these, and again, when you look at this bacteria under a microscope, amazing in and of itself and all the mechanisms it has for itself to survive. I mean, for a bacteria to survive within a stomach enzyme or within the digestive system of anything, I mean, it has to be very well built. And a termite to have the jaws to be able to crunch wood and chew it down has to have some very intelligent design. But then the Lord paired those things together, I believe, just to slap the evolutionists in the face, face with the question, which one evolved first? And there are thousands of examples of this, by the way. What about the bombardier beetle? Have you guys ever heard of the bombardier beetle? We would know them as stink bugs. They're not the stink bugs we have out here. But the bombardier beetle is a very interesting little beetle, a creeping thing that was created on day six. The creepy crawlies, right? So the bombardier beetle is kind of slow. It's not very agile. It kind of bumbles everywhere. It's like, blah, blah, blah. like that's how it walks, right? So it's not very fast. And when something comes to attack it, it doesn't run away. It actually stands with its butt up in the air and kind of hunches like this. And you're like, that's the stupidest defense mechanism ever anyway, because it doesn't do it while facing the animal. Like if you're going to posture like a bear's running towards you, you make yourself look big facing it, not with your back turned to it. But this is what the bombardier beetle does. It turns around, pokes its butt up, and it stances. And you're like, okay, what's going to happen now? Well, if a frog or a reptile comes up upon this bombardier beetle and it takes a bite, right well, as it takes a bite, there is a little pop, a little flash, and a gas cloud that comes out of the back of this bombardier beetle. Very dangerous flatulence, we'll put it that way. And all of a sudden, the would-be attacker gets a, a mist full of this poisonous gas, and he's like, oh, you know what I mean? And much like the skunk, ends up having to run away. And by the way, it's not just a gas or a mist that comes out. It comes out at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, over boiling. It just comes out like a blast of hot, stinky gas in the face of the would-be attacker. Now, how does it do this, and why would that be its choice of evolutionary defense mechanism? Well, it's interesting. It actually has in its, in its the bottom part of its, its uh, I think it's thorax or whatever, in its abdomen, it has two chambers. Imagine it like two gas cylinders, right, or two propane tanks. They are separate from each other. And the reason why is because they're very reactant chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinine. 
two of these gases, these chemicals, have to be stored separately because when you mix them together, you get a hot burst of explosive gas. Two separate. Not only that, it's got a spray nozzle in its backside that can move side to side and be aimed from behind its back while it's looking this way. And it could shoot with the expertise of a marksman. But here's the thing. The valves have to open at the exact time outside of the nozzle so that when they hit each other, it doesn't cause the explosion on the inside of the beetle. Two chambers, two valves, a, a, a nozzle that can be aimed, and a, and a hot flash or blast of gas. I'm just glad humans didn't evolve with this defense mechanism. <laughs> but that's how the beetle do. Now, question for you. There are so many, and that's, that's just a broad overview of how these mechanisms work because there's also its nervous system that can sense when a predator is behind it, which triggers when and where it's going to release that, get those two chemicals in order to cause the chemical reaction. It's, it's all throughout its whole body. It is, is designed for that defense mechanism. Now, question, which evolved first? The two chambers, the chemicals, the nozzle, the valves. Because if the two chemicals evolved without the chambers, the first bombardier beetle that evolved that way, you'd see crawl out of the egg and go, Poof, and that would be it, the end of gene pool. That mutation is no longer there. Or let's just say you evolved the chemicals and the chambers, but no release valves. Then you would just have a bombardier beetle who sticks its butt up, but no chemical reaction happens because the valves don't open because there's no valves and he gets eaten anyway. End of gene pool. Or let's just say it didn't have a hard enough shell to take the heat. And the first time it sprays the gas without the spray nozzle, it just emits a hot mist that melts the bug. End of gene pool. And you go down all of these mechanisms that had to have, air quote, evolved in order to be in place for a functioning system that works as a defense mechanism for this bombardier beetle. And you look at it and you're like, man, this is a system. There's no way any one of those little components being removed, there's no way the beetle could have survived. All of the information the complete system had to have been designed up front. You could not have piecemealed it through random chance or it would have killed itself. And then finally, my favorite, the duck-billed platypus. Slide number three, I believe God created the duck-billed platypus. Oh yeah, uh, the fedoras for optional secret missions. Oh, to Phineas and Ferb, you guys, you know. A platypus. Perry the platypus, right? That's Perry the platypus, right? A platypus is, I believe, God's ode to the evolutionist. It really is the one animal, because I believe uh, it, when it comes to the arguments of intelligent design, you could look at any animal, any cell, any system, and say any one of these things, it, it, according to the principle of irreducible complexity, could not have one of the components missing. But then the Lord's like, hey, I'm going to really baffle the scientists. He took like a handful of all components and threw it down on the ground and the platypus came forth. Because think about this. It, you know, we think that the bird evolved one way to do one thing. We think that the reptile evolved another way to do another thing. And we think that a, a seal or a mammal evolved. And they're all different branches or species, right? Then you have the platypus that goes across all barriers. First and foremost, a platypus is born out of an egg. A platypus is born out of an egg. But the mother feeds it milk, which technically makes it a mammal, right? Because we get the word mammary from mammals. It means those who breastfeed their young, right? It's a mammal. But the platypus doesn't have mammary glands. It doesn't have a, a, a teat. It does not have anything by which to breastfeed the, the baby platypus. It sweats milk through glands on its body and then comes to drips at the end of its fur, and the baby platypus eats the drips of milk that have been sweat through the fur to the baby platypus. That's what it, so it has milk, but no mechanism to give the milk, but it's born out of an egg. It's got a duck bill. But it's not a bird because it has hair. 
It's got a beaver tail, but it's not thick like a beaver's tail. It's only used in swimming. It has webbed feet. It has webbed feet, and the males have a spike on one of their back webbed feet that is venomous, like a single fang coming off the back of its leg. What on earth is it? <laughs> what, what is it? But when it comes to irreducible complexity, that's, I think, where it really takes the cake. Because as the platypus dives into the water to go feed upon shrimp or crayfish or other fish that are hiding in the mud, as it dives under murky waters of Australian rivers and streams, it closes its eyes with special eyelids. And it even has lids that close its ears so that the water cannot get into its eyes and ears. Now, have you ever gone fishing blindfolded? That's what the platypus does. It fishes blindfolded and holding its ears, probably not going la la la, because I don't know if I have a you know, real functional tongue and it doesn't have lips. But it fishes blindfolded. How does it even find the fish? Well, that duck bill that you see there has one of the most sensitive array of, of um, receptors in its, in its bill where it could sense the muscle contractions within shrimp, within fish, within any creature that it's hunting for. It has this, this electroreceptor uh, electro in its nose, in its bill, where it can dig under the sand. And the moment it feels a fish flinch, it could grab it. Not by sight and not by hearing, but by the sensitivity. And it is so sensitive, human beings have yet to replicate any technology, any electroreceptor uh, technology that can even compare to the strength of the platypus's bill. Now, which evolved first? <laughs> the, the, the eyelids, the earlids, or the electroreceptors? Because if the electroreceptors evolved first, right? But you didn't have the eyelids and earlids. You would go down and all of a sudden the water would go into its ears and into its eyes and into its nose and it'd start suffocating. So even though it could sense shrimp underwater, it can't go underwater very long because it can't close out the water. What about if the lids on its eyes, ears and nose, what if those evolved first without the electroreceptors? Now you just have a blind fisherman. Which one evolved first? Uh, which one evolved first? The fact that they burrow 65 feet into mud in order to lay their eggs or the venomous spike on its back leg? Because the males will dig the hole, but when they're digging the hole, their head is face down and they can't necessarily sense what's coming up behind them. And if a dingo or a coyote or any other predator comes to try to munch the, the, the backside of this platypus, it has a defense mechanism. Which evolved first, laying eggs or the spike? Because you lay the eggs without the spike and a dingo eats your baby, right? A dingo munches your beaver tail. That, which one evolved first? All of them are codependent for this platypus to be alive and survive any circumstance. I really do believe it is a finger in the eye of the evolutionist. And the Lord designs things like that. The Holy Spirit deals in puns. He deals in, 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 a, in a means of making sure everyone who looks upon his creation knows beyond the shadow of a doubt that God is creator. That is what Romans 1 clearly states. For since the beginning, his invisible attributes have been clearly, not dimly, clearly seen in his creation. And we see it with animals like this. Now, the thing that displays his glory the most is not the platypus. It's not the bombardier beetle. It's not even the termite. It is what he creates at the end of the sixth day. And we see that in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle of all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, 
And God said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God now creates the thing that he was creating everything else for, which is man. Now it starts off with, in verse 26, let us make man in our image. Who's the us? Because there are some denominations will say the us is the hosts of the angels. And God is telling the angels, hey, let us make man in our image. Is God making man in the image of angels? No, we see that in Psalm 8. Psalm 8, actually, verse 3 says, When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and with honor. And you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand, and you have put all things under his feet. The Lord is saying through the psalmist here that man is different than the angels. Man is created with a very specific purpose. So here the us cannot be the angels. If it were the angels, then here in Psalm 8, the psalmist would be wrong because we have been made a little lower than the angels. We've been made of a different quality. Now, it's interesting that in the book of Hebrews, uh, the writer of Hebrews will actually point to Psalm 8 and he'll quote that passage I quoted to you, but he attributes it to Christ. He attributes it to Jesus. And, and just, just, just a little thought for you to, to, to chase down, a little rabbit. We often think God created man, man jacked up, and then God had to become a man in order to fix man, right? And that's true from our perspective, but according to this, we were created in his image, and Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. It says that he bears his scars in eternity. So technically speaking, he had, from eternity past, put on a human frame before he framed humans. I don't know what that means. Think about that. Chase that one down yourselves. Not making doctrine about that thing. But what does it mean to be made in his image? So the us there has, can't be speaking of the angels. It has to be speaking of the Trinity, of the Godhead, of, of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? And, and he's saying that we want to make man different than the things that we spoke into existence earlier on. We want to make him in our image and in our likeness. Well, what does that mean? Well, within the context of that verse, one, one insight is given. It's to have dominion. It's to be over, to be a good steward, a lord over all of the things that God created that were lower than us. To be a good steward over the creation, to be a good steward over the animals, over the plant life, to tend to the garden, to tend to your family and, and be fruitful and multiply. And we know that the Lord is the one who tends to all our needs. The Lord has dominion over the whole universe, including man. So that's one of the aspects of God's image is the idea that we were created to rule and reign. And then we eventually, when we get to Genesis 3, we, we for, forgave that or uh, we, we forgo that um, dominion and gave it into someone else's hands willingly. But that's what we were created to do, that dominion aspect. Now, there are people who will take that aspect of what it means to be made in the image of God and they'll run with it. And they'll be like, that means we have to rule and reign here today over America. And our dominion is to, is to rule and reign over the liberals, you know what I mean? And, the, and it's like, no, 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 homie, that's, that ain't it, right? You know what I mean? We're, we've lost the dominion when we, when we were uh, fallen in our sin. And when Christ has purchased us back, when we come back with him, then we'll rule and reign. But not before then. Not before he rules and reigns rightly, right? So there's that aspect. That is one aspect, I believe, of what it means to be created in the image of God. What about the triune nature of man? We know that God is a triune being. being. He is one God, three different persons, three different attributes of his character, and they're all one at the same time. If you don't understand that, that's a good thing, because that means you can fully wrap your head around a God that is bigger than you. We shouldn't be able to. If we could fully comprehend any God and say, this is how he operates, that makes us God means that we have submitted him to our thinking. There are aspects of God you will never comprehend until you see him face to face, and even then you will be learning of his grace for the ages to come. He is that, there's an aspect of him that is, that is unknowable, immutable, beyond us. But the triune nature, we know 
that he is body, so he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? We know that man is triune themselves. We have a, we have a body. We are not our bodies, which, by the way, speaks to the aspect of why you shouldn't listen to your flesh. You own your flesh. Your flesh should not own you. You have a body. You are not your body. And if your body, your flesh, is ruling over your desires, your body has brought you into subje subjection as opposed to you bringing it unto subjection. You have a body. You communicate with a soul. You are a spirit. That's the difference we'll see. He breathes the breath of life into the frame of this being called Adam. It's different. He doesn't do that with any other animal. So we are triune in our nature, body, soul, spirit. That's exactly how we're made. And, and God is triune in his nature. So I think that's an aspect of it. There are some who say, well, God is a creator, right? God creates something out of nothing. That means human beings, when we are born of the spirit of God, we have the right to speak things into existence. And if we say, thus cometh Alexis, Alexis shall manifest within my lifetime. God, throughout Scripture, always reserves the ability to create something from nothing for himself. We see that in the book of Isaiah. We see that all throughout Scripture. God is creator. When men deny him as creator is when we start becoming ungrateful, and it's when we start going down a line that we see in Romans chapter 1. God is creator. And Adam knows that. So what does it mean to be made in his image and likeness? Uh, and as, as diverse and as deep as that question is, I actually think it's a lot more simple than we are giving it credit. I, I think we sometimes say, oh, what does it mean? Because we need to know God, then we'll know ourselves. It's like, no, he, he kind of already told you the answer. First of all, likeness is the Hebrew word demuth, and it means similitude or fashion. It means it's shaped or manner, it has a certain manner that's the same. Image is the Hebrew word selem, which means semblance, which comes from a root word to mean cut out of or a stencil or a mold, something that's been cut out of. Actually, the very root word of it means a shadow, a shadow, the image of God. The root word for that selem, for that Hebrew word, means a shadow. Which, by the way, when we get into next week and the week after, I'm going to be talking about how mankind, Adam in particular, is a foreshadow, is a prophetic pattern of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, to come. Mankind's predicament and existence is a foreshadow, is a shadow that would tell us about God. It would tell us about his nature, and I believe sets a prophetic pattern, but we'll get to that in coming weeks. So it means similitude, fashion, to be cut out of a stencil, a mold, a shape, or a shadow. So what does it mean to be in his image and his likeness? Do you remember what word was repeated over and over and over again in this chapter? Kind. He made them according to their kind. According to their kind, he made them. They reproduce according to their kind, according to its kind. Verse 11, 12, 21, 24, 25, over and over again, according to its kind. Now, when we speak about these kinds of animals, it's speaking of an assigned, separate, distinct species of plant or animal that has the ability to communicate, the ability to have intimate relations, uh, relationships, family structures to bear fruit and offspring, to have community with that kind of animal. I do not believe a cat can understand a dog's bark. I just understand, he probably understands I should get out of here because that was loud and scary or I'm gonna stand and skibbity pap them in the face until he gets away from me, right? That's what they, but they don't understand the tone, the tenses of a dog's bark. And a dog, I don't think, can understand the song of the whales. But other whales do, because they communicate. They're of the same kind, they communicate, they have family structures, they have communion with one another. They reproduce, they bear fruit according to their kind. So what God is saying here is, I'm going to create a being that will be of my kind, of my family, of my community, that I will communicate and have intimate relationship with. That is the purpose of why he created man in his image, because you have communion with things that are in your likeness. It, it's as simple as that. God created him according to his kind. 
Now, that's, that does not mean we are gods, G-O-D-S. We are not gods, but we are gods, G-O-D apostrophe S. We are his. We are of his kind. We were created to be part of his family, of his image and likeness. Man is not animal. He is different, has a different purpose and a different intention. He has a different role, a different function in all of creation. And the function is determined by the one who's supposed to be communicating to him according to his own image and likeness. When you take the idea of being formed in the image and likeness of God and you add it to the rest of the chapter where it says according to its kind, according to its kind, according to its kind, you get the idea that God created you to be a part of his community fellowship and kind, to be a part of his intimate fellowship, that you would be fruitful and multiply and make disciples that also communicate with God most high. I believe that's what it means. We'll get more into that in the next chapters when we see God walking in the cool of the garden with Adam. God asking them questions when they're in a predicament. God providing them with skins of a slaughtered animal when they fall. And even in the next chapter, we see Adam placed into the Garden of Eden. And after God has already filled the whole earth with animals, he places him in the Garden of Eden and he starts bringing up every single one of the animals he's already created in the eyes of Adam. So Adam could know two things. God, you are creator. You're the one who made all these other species because you're pulling them out of the ground. And I get to I got to name it, an, you know, anteater, aardvark, antelope. I get to name it all. So one thing I know, Adam would say, is God, you are creator. And the second thing he would get to know is when he gets to zebra, there was none like him. And he is built for communication with something else. Doesn't mean we don't love the animals. Doesn't mean we don't protect them. We're supposed to have dominion. You know, we're supposed to be able to look out for them. But they are not us. We are not them. Even Baxter, even my little fluffy dog who cuddles with us and bites us, He's brought into our family, but he is not one of my children. You know, it's, you're, you're not a, you're not a fur, it's not a fur baby, and you're not a cat mother. <laughs> it gets a little weird. But I believe what it simply means to be made in his image is we were made for the purpose of intimate communion and fellowship, to be part of his family. Now, ending in verse 29 through 31, after God creates this, he creates man. He creates them in his image. He blesses them. And again, that day is going to be more expounded upon in the next chapter. What The exact details of that creation of that day. He says, verse 29, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given the green herb for food, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning was the sixth day. First and foremost, to answer your question, yes, everything was vegetarian at the Garden of Eden. But all the vegetables had a lot more nutrition than the vegetables today. Vegetables 25 years ago had a lot more nutrition than they have today, right? So... Yes, they were all vegetarian after the flood is when people were going to become carnivores because I believe the whole structure of the earth changed. We didn't have a barrier there, so we needed protein, and you do need protein in your diet. All right. We'll get to that when we get to the flood and the fall. But the thing I want you guys to see here is that the Lord not only blesses them, not only puts them in a garden, not only places them in a high standing because he's communicating one-on-one -on -one with them, but he tells them very, something very specific See, see everything that I have given you. Open your eyes, look around. I made this all for you. That is indicative of his love for mankind. I give you everything you need is what he's saying there. Look around you. Look around and see the trees and see the animals and see the fruit and see the vegetables and see the cool breeze and the mist that comes up from the garden. See that you have protection and provision. It shows you, Adam, Eve, I love you. The love of God. And the Lord saying, see. And then the Lord, at the end of the chapter, in verse 31 says, 
than God saw. God sees everything he created and he said it is very good. This is how I wanted it to be created. God sees what he created and he says it's very good, but he asks Adam and Eve to see and come to their own conclusion. He gives them a choice. Look around you. God sees it's very good. Now, where we live today, we live in the shadow and under the bondage of the fall and of the curse of sin. And that curse and that bondage and the disease and pestilence and rage and anger and division and chaos that comes with it makes it very hard for us to see what God has placed in front of us. It does. If the Lord were to say to you, see everything I have made, you would be, but Lord, they're killing babies. But Lord, they're indoctrinating the young. But Lord, men are killing each other in the streets for no reason. But Lord, there's pestilence, there's plague, there's famine. Lord, I see chaos. I believe the Lord would say to us, look harder. Look harder. And sometimes in our lives, we come up upon the sin and the effects of sin in this world. And the Lord tells us to see, to see with his eyes, much like Elisha's servant who sees all of the armies coming around the city to kill Elisha. And he's like, we are doomed. And Elisha prays to the Lord and says, let him see. And then he sees oh, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. See, when you see with God's eyes, you will see that it is very good. Even in the chaos, I believe, because the chaos does not usurp the sovereignty, goodness, mercy, grace, and love of our God. It does not, it can't. His, his attributes are immutable. That means no matter what's going on on the earth, he remains good, he remains sovereign, he remains loving, he remains merciful, and he remains forgiving. So no matter what we see with our eyes, if we see through the eyes of the spirit, we can then say, Lord, you have laid out good works for me to walk into. It is good. The pain, Lord, is good because you're using it for your purpose. My blessed hope of knowing that these days will come to an end and I will be with you sooner rather than later. Oh, Lord, it is very good. If you see that all of these things are pointing to his soon return, you'll then think it is very good. You'll weep, you'll cry, you'll mourn for the injustice, the sickness, and death. But you'll cry out, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord. I, you will look up and see his return is soon. It takes a choice, though. We must choose to see what the Lord sees. Are we looking through the eyes of the flesh and simply coming to the conclusion all is lost? Might as well drink and party like it's 1999 because tomorrow we die. Or do we see that there is a future intention and hope even through the chaos? What are you beholding? What are you looking upon? First John chapter three, verse one through three says this. Behold, what manner of love the father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has yet, not yet been revealed to us what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Saints, I know the fall has tainted what we see in this earth, but I beg of you that just like the Lord asked Adam and Eve as he placed them in the garden in that finished creation, he said, see all that I have made for you. Ask the Lord in the life that we live today and in the days that we live, let me see with your eyes. Let me not see through the eyes of the flesh. Let me behold that we are sons of you and you and daughters of the Most High. And you have a plan for everyone who is part of your family. And more importantly, let me see that these things are pointing to your soon return. And then I shall truly see who you are and who I am in you. May you see with the eyes of the Spirit. And may you go forth and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word. I thank you that it challenges us today. And I pray that as we continue our journey through Genesis, you would continue to reveal yourself today 
in our hearts. Father, thank you for this fellowship. I pray that you would bless it and you would protect all of the saints. May we meditate upon these words until you come, until we go, or until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.